morning everybody crafting journey here that journey chick on instagram happy friday yeah friday dance we're gonna do slow dance today slow dance okay i'm being silly uh look it's getting done i got the rabbit done i did diamond paint for a little bit yesterday um, started to feel much better yesterday afternoon. Today I'm a little, a little foggy, but I'm going to work. Gotta go to work, 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 work. I want to show you what I got in the mail, and it's not. Uh, I did. I already opened it because I knew what it was. I ordered it, and it is more of these super cool containers that come from. Hold on, I will tell you where they come from. Wilson's 3D Designs. Um, Pam over at Wilson 3D Designs um, makes these, and oh, they're so cool. And look at the pretty color, purple. I know some of you guys out there love purple. We have So now I have two, pink and purple. I love this purple. Okay, so. Yes, I'm feeling better. I'm going to work. I'm going to miss my Animal Crossing. I was sitting in bed last night in a Zoom meeting with a bunch of other Animal Crossers, Crossing Crafters, Animal Crossing Crafters, and just having the best time. Nobody was talking about their aches and pains, and we were just all enjoying the game and helping each other out, and it was fun. And I got a bunch of tips and tricks. So that was worth it. Oh, I don't want to go to work. Anyhow. All right, let's turn the light pad on. The end is in sight for this painting. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. All right. We do not want to get a copyright strike first thing in the morning so we will stop that so yesterday I just sat in my chair well I slept most of the morning um, then I got I said you know I've got to get up um, so I sat in my chair and I crocheted like for hours <laughs> I'm making a yellow scarf um, so then, uh, what else was I doing? Oh, watching the trial. God, my head's still a little foggy. Um, I was crocheting and watching the trial. And then I decided, well, I feel a little better. Let me come diamond paint and watch some more of the trial. So I was diamond painting and watching the trial. And, um, you know, I, I was talking to Cheryl yesterday, Cheryl Katz on messenger and she's like how is this guy you know clearly you know he confessed he's guilty and i thought you know i said to her oh, maybe i think they're going to go with the, the the fact that this is a false confession um okay but after watching yesterday i'm not so sure that they're going to get i mean it just looks like i mean i don't know it looks like he's guilty as all get out um but uh, anyway let's let's take it from the top shall we <laughs> um but first but first you know who says but first julie chen oh i'm sorry julie chen moonvez that that's from big brother and it's coming back it's it's starting soon i am so excited that is like my favorite show ever big brother also, another show that I am totally into, um, you know, TV Time with Crashly and Crafting Journey. We're going to be discussing the show um, Dickinson. It's a show on Apple TV. It's a 30-minute. It's comedy. Uh, it, it's so good. It is such a good show. It is so well done. The writing is amazing. Um so I think I'm on episode, I see I was trying to just watch two episodes a night, but I accidentally watched three last night because it's just so good. Um, so 
we're trying to finish season one this week and then Sunday uh, at 6 central in Crafting with Crashly, her live, we're going to discuss it. It's just a little segment during her live. It's not the whole live. We're just going to discuss what we thought of that show. Um, I think it's awesome. Yeah. And like I said, it's called Dickinson on Apple TV. And it's about the life of Emily Dickinson. But the, it's not literal. It's it's There's a lot of modern day twists to it. Like at one point they're having a party and they're like doing this formal, you know, dance that they would have done back in the day, you know, where they all choreographed it. And then they all start busting into twerking. It's very funny. I know I just lost half of you. It's funny. Trust me. And it's, um, and then they weave Emily Dickinson poetry through the show and it's just so well done. Really well done. Okay. It is National Pizza Party Day, guys. And I thought that was so appropriate because it's Friday, it's payday. When I'm on my way home, I'm going to pick up a pizza. You know, we have this thing called Papa Murphy where you pick up the pizza and it's frozen and you just put it in the oven. Now, I tried it once. I didn't particularly care for it, so I don't think I'm going to do that. And then the, the other day I tried to, I've been putting it off and putting it off because it's not cheap. I wanted to order from the local pizza joint, you know, the real Italian pizza joint. They didn't pick up the phone. I, I, I guess they were that busy that they couldn't answer the phone. So I didn't get a pizza. Now I've got the, the dollar Totino pizzas in the oven, but that's, it, or in the freezer, but that's just not the same as a good old New York greasy pizza with pepperoni. Oh my God. The kind you have to like put the napkin on the top to soak up the grease before you eat it. That's the best. And you don't need a reason to have a pizza party, guys. You can have a pizza party for like, you know, uh, your car hit 85,000 miles. Have a pizza party. Um, you went 10 days with out road rage, or you just woke up this morning. That's what I'm going to do. Or I had to go to work on Friday. Let's have a pizza party. <laughs> Jen, in your live, please have a pizza party. How about Mickey, you too, pizza party. Pizza party, pizza party. Any excuse you can think of is a good one for a pizza party. And you know what? We're, pa we're past this COVID. For the most part, we're past this COVID. Get your friends and family together and let's have some pizza. I think um, tonight or tomorrow night, my grandson is having a graduation party with his friends. It's not it's not for the parents and the grandparents. It's not that kind of party. It's, you know, his party, graduation party. And I'm going to bet you they have pizza. Yeah, pizza pie. Pizza. I should... I should call him and ask him, maybe I can order some pizza for him. I was trying to think yesterday, what's a good graduation gift for him? Maybe if I send over a bunch of pizzas for him and his friends. Oh, pizza from grandma. Okay. It hurts to be so cheerful. My ribs hurt. <laughs> God, I'm going to last this day. I'm determined. I'm going to last throughout the day. You know, you always feel really bad at night and first thing in the morning. So I'll be fine. I will be fine. Okay, let's do Judge, Jury, and Journey. I almost forgot the title there for a second. Oh, I hope I don't mess up today because, man. All right. Lots of testimony. So let me just finish up day one, um, part two. This is day one, part two. Just two more witnesses on day one. The Paw Chic Patrol Deputy. This ha happened in a county called Paw Chic, Paw Chic, Paw Chic, Paw Chic. I don't know. It's in Idaho. Paw Chic Patrol Deputy. He is the per person that gets called out on July 19th, which is a Thursday. Um, the last known sighting of this woman or this young woman is on Wednesday. He gets called out on Thursday um, to take a missing person report. 
So he goes out to the residence of um, the brother, it, you know, what's his name? Blake Jack's home, where she is kind of like living with her boyfriend, Dalton. And I, I don't know if you guys recall, Blake and his wife, Allie, are living. That's their home. They live there, but they're out of town working for the most part. Then um, Dalton, her boyfriend, also lives there. And she was staying there house-sitting, but she stayed there a lot anyway, taking care of the dogs. She goes jogging. That's the last time she's seen. So that's a Wednesday. This is a Thursday. He goes out. He takes the call. Doesn't see anything, you know. He said it's a normal, you know, young teenager's house. You know, there's dishes in the sink. He says it's not terribly messy, but, you know, a little cluttered. Um, he said, you know, the boyfriend had normal demeanor, you know, nothing untoward that would make him suspect the boyfriend. Um, he said when he got there, there were about six people there. So it was uh, Blake and his wife, the boyfriend, and some neighbors, some friends. Um, and then the neighbor said he uh, saw her running in the evening. So he takes the report. Um, and that's his testimony. Then the next person on the stand is, I can't read my own writing, uh, Juliana Schecht. This is the victim's employer, um, Molly's employer. She worked at a daycare center in a hospital. She was supposed to work the late shift that day. They had a field trip first thing in the morning. She doesn't show up. <laughs> And, um, you know, and the woman's testimony is that on field trip days, they're really busy. They've got lots more kids. And um, so she doesn't show up. She doesn't call. So the woman goes ahead and does the field trip. Uh, when she gets back from the field trip about three o'clock, there's still no word from Molly. So now she's starting to text and call her and not getting any response. So she sent a message to her cousin Kelsey and Kelsey is the one that uh, ultimately notifies calls Dalton and Dalton calls Blake and they all rush home to find her okay so now uh, day two we have day two we get the owner of the hair salon now Keep in mind, this is a very small town. Everybody knows everybody. Her name is Christy Stewart. She owns the local hair salon. Molly was a client of hers, so she knows who Molly is. She's known Molly for many, many years since she moved to town. <laughs> um, and on the 18th, that Wednesday, she was in her vehicle driving out to her mother's farm. She... Um, this could only happen in Iowa, right? The, she, they had corn for dinner and they wanted to take the leftovers to feed the horses. But they were, she said she went out to her mom's, you know, a couple times a week so the kids could feed the horses and she could visit with her mom. So she's driving out there with the kids and she passes, um, there's a, a road, it's 385th Street. So she passes Molly um, and she she recognizes, she knows it's Molly. Molly was jogging. She describes what she was wearing. And um, then she just, she doesn't wave or say anything. She just passes her. She knows who she is and she keeps going to her mom's house and spends 20, 30 minutes and then returns home. Um, so this is the last known sighting of Molly. Tibbets and this and she puts the time at about 7 45 p.m. So that is her testimony. I gotta breathe. Hmm. So then we have um, the testimony of Arlie Lorenzana, Lorenzana, who is the cousin of the defendant and i'm just going to say the defendant because i cannot for the life of me pronounce his name i'm probably butchering it um christian behema rivera christian yeah, anyway this is his cousin 
So she testifies that she owns the black, she owns a black Chevy, Chevy Malibu that she bought for him. Now she is the registered owner. She makes the payments, but he pays her. And he, since she bought it for him, he's paid her every single month. She, you know, she doesn't have to chase him for the money. He pays for it. Um, but the reason she did this for him is, and she was very evasive about this, but it's because he's undocumented. He's from Mexico. He's here without papers. He couldn't buy the vehicle himself, um, but he's employed and he paid her every month for this vehicle. But what he does with the car is he like soups it up. Like, is that a word anymore? Does anybody use that word? He, um, he, he changes out the mirror. He's got these chrome mirrors and these chrome mags on the tires and chrome door handles. So it's now a very distinct vehicle. <laughs> like you see it and you're like, oh, that's him. The next person on the stand is Detective Kiwi. Um, he's also with the Pawsheek uh, County Sheriff's Office. And um, his testimony is interesting. He... Um, you know, he was aware that there had been surveillance footage taken from um, a home of Logan Collins that I just mentioned before. Or did I mention it? Oh, my God, what is going on here? Okay, the next person on the stand is Detective Stephen Keeby. Um, he was aware that they had collected videos of uh, surveillance footage from numerous sources. He was aware that uh, there was video from a person named Logan Collins, who was kind of this tech geek and he had cameras set up in four places in his house. And he was aware that on this video, they had seen this one vehicle pass um, several times during this time frame. And I've already told you that it was a very distinct vehicle. It was the black Chevy Malibu um, with uh, this chrome, plating so he's kind of like on the lookout so he's driving one day and he sees the vehicle lingering uh you know around so he gets behind it and um he, he just follows it this is like august 16th ish and he uh finally the defendant kind of pulls off into an alley. So he pulls off behind him. The defendant stops. He gets out. Um, now, he said clearly he recognized right away that the defendant spoke no English. But a neighbor, come, a nosy neighbor comes up and he speaks Spanish. So he helps him interpret. So, uh, and he says the guy's demeanor is very calm. Not He's not panicking, nothing. You know, he's just very calm. And... Um, he he just you know he ran the tag it came back to his cousin and and he explained you know why why it comes back to his cousin um so he took pictures of the car including the license plate and he took pictures of the defendant and he asked him you know do you know molly tibbetts and he's like well i heard she was missing but no i, I don't know her um he denied any knowledge of her um he, he didn't seem nervous at all um, and the other thing this detective uh, testifies to is, you know, when they pull Molly's cell phone records, um, according to what they could find, and I don't know how they did this, I guess there'll be more testimony later on. They, they could tell that all of a sudden at around 7.55-ish that evening, um, all of a sudden her cell phone you know, goes from traveling very slowly to traveling about 55 miles an hour uh, across a gravel road. So um, The other interesting thing um, that was brought out on cross-examination <laughs> is that there's a lot, there seems to be a lot of sexual deviants that live in this rural area. Maybe this is the only place that they can live. I don't know. They were all, you know, there was one uh, interesting fellow. I'm not going to say his name because, you know, he's not really a suspect. 
he had a violent history against women. Um, and this is actually, um, his house is very close to where this body was found, her bo Molly's body was found. So the defense keeps hammering on this person. You know, he's a sexual deviant. Did you investigate him? The body was found near his house. Um, so this officer also took place um, when all of the agencies got together and went to the defendant's employer to interview him. He didn't take part in the interview, um, but he was present uh, at the employer's. Um, there was, that's an interesting testimony also that, that comes later. And he does testify that the body was found in a cornfield about 4.30 a.m. on August 20th, um, shortly after they all go to the employer and canvas the employer and interview the defendant. Um, they never found a murder weapon. Now, I still don't know how she was killed. They still, no one has said yet how she died. Um, so then the next person to testify is Logan Collins. Now, he's the one that has the four surveillance cameras. Um, and he just, he's, he's on the stand for a very pre brief period of time just to establish that he has these set up. It does, it does contain, um, the DVR keeps the footage for 30 days. Um, and he did turn that over to the police. Then we get the uh, Department of Criminal Investigation, which is like the state um, department. They come in, an agent comes in, um, and he examines the video that was that Logan Collins, you know, gave to the police department. And he has some help because, <laughs> but he does see the runner. Um, you know, he, there's a runner you can see on a cross street and it's kind of like a shadow and he sees that runner. And then the next, um, what he does is he has his, he divides it up and he has each per, each four people helping him and each person logs everything you can see on the, each of those cameras um, and puts in a time. And then he puts it all into this spreadsheet. And he said, when he put it all together, Time-wise, you, you know, you see the runner, 7.45-ish running. The next four entries time-wise were this vehicle, the black Chevy Malibu with the chrome stuff on it. Um, um, so th this vehicle is seen four times between 7.55 and 7.45 and 8.06 p.m. Going different directions on different cameras, which is interesting. All right, the next person to testify is Mike Fisher from Homeland Security. He also took place in the August 20th canvas of the victim's employer. He is fluent in Spanish. Um, he uh, does immigration crimes. Um, he goes out to this Yerby Farms with everybody to canvas it. Um, he testifies that the defendant was located. He was brought to a common area. And he also testifies that they did this with the permission of the employer. They went to the employer first and said, you know, we want to talk to your workers. And they said, yeah, you can talk to our, their workers. Um, the defendant gave them permission to search his vehicles. It, apparently that day he was driving an Altima. So now we find out he's got two vehicles. He has an Altima and he has the black Chevy Malibu. Um, he says he did not know Molly and, um, yeah, so that, that is officer Fisher's, Fischetto Fisher's, Mike Fisher's. Fisher's testimony. Then we get Scott Green. He's from the Gaming Bureau. See, they have everybody. They've got DCI, FBI, the Gaming Bureau, the Department of Homeland Security. And so it's funny because all of them participate in this canvas of the employer. Um, 
to locate the defendant. And one guy testifies that, oh, there was like 20 of us that went out there. One guy says, oh, no, it was just six of us. And then that same guy later testifies, no, there was 12 of us. Like, what? How many really were there of you that you needed to go out here? Now, this guy has really interesting testimony. Um, he said he participated in the canvas. He took DNA samples from all of the Hispanic employees. They, well, the, all the employees were Hispanic. This is like a dairy farm there where they milk the cows. And yeah, um, that's what the defendant's job was. He milked cows. So um, he did buckle swabs, you know, where they go in and they swab the cheek of these employers. And he's like, well, why did you guys do that? Well, we wanted to make sure that, you know, none of them were going to match the crime. You know, if we, whenever we found, the, he was stumbling. He, he didn't know why they did that. He was just told to do it. Um, and he says, well, didn't you take, this is the cross, this lawyer for the cross, cross or the defendant. And I'm sorry, I, I apologize. I'm stumbling today, but I still have some brain fog here. But he testifies that he took place in other canvases, like when they canvassed the neighborhood and they talked to a bunch of other people. And the, so the defense attorney says, well, you didn't, did you take buckle swabs from them? And he's like, well, no. He goes, well, when you can't, you know, it was, it was a canvas, you know, you, so you, you took buckle swabs, swabs from all the Hispanic employees, but you didn't take buckle swabs from all the Caucasian people that you canvassed. And he's like, no. I don't know where he's going with that, but I'm thinking, oh, interesting. Good point. Um, then we have Pamela Rivero. She is a part-time law enforcement officer. Now, she takes the stand. This is a key, key witness. And I am going, I'm not finished watching all of her testimony because she's on the stand for several hours. Um, but she, at the time she was a law enforcement officer, she now has three children at home. She does not, she works part-time as a law enforcement officer. Um, but she's, Spanish is her first language. And she was brought in, uh, she worked for a different agency, but she's brought in to interview the defendant. Um, so this is really interesting testimony. So I'm going to cover that tomorrow because we get to a really, I, I got up to a really interesting spot where I had to, I had to rewind and listen to it again because I just, I thought, I, am I missing something? So I'm going to cover that tomorrow. Make sure you tune in tomorrow because we're going to hear the interview of the defendant. Let me say his name again. The defendant. <laughs> I'm going to remember this eventually. Christian Bahama Rivera. She interviews Christian Bahama Rivera. Okay. So. Let's diamond paint for a second while I find this day in history. Do, 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 do. It's interesting, this day in history. Now, I can't skip it because when I skip this day in history, you guys go, you skip this day in history. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So I picked a crime, a, another crime one. These two teenagers well they're you know they're they're not really teenagers but they're well i guess they are they're they're um late teens um nathan leopold and richard loeb and this is in 1924 they decide they are going to commit the perfect murder um they're very, very intelligent uh, teenagers. Leopold graduated from the University of Chicago at 18 years old. He spoke nine languages and had an IQ of 200. Um, Loeb graduated from college at 17 and was fascinated with criminal psychology. So they get together and they make a little deal and they decide they're going to commit the perfect murder. But there was, unfortunately, there were so many flaws in this murder that they were caught, like, right away. 
Um, so they decide they are going to kidnap and kill 14-year-old Bobby Franks. Now, Bobby Franks was uh, one of them's cousin or distant cousin. Um, so they, they, they put him in the back seat of a rented car. They, they kill him in the back seat. Um, Loeb stabs him. He, he's on the floor in the back seat. They wait till he bleeds out and dies. And then they take him out and they dump the body. And then they try to conceal it. They put it in, put him in a wooded area. Um, they try to conceal the body. Apparently not very well because he's discovered, the body is discovered two days later. Now, interestingly, near the body, they find a pair of glasses. So they take this, the glasses to an optometrist and the optometrist said, well, there's only, I've only written three prescriptions for this kind of glass, this, these glasses. Um, and two people they ruled out right away because they had their glasses. And the third person was Leopold. And Leopold says, oh, yes, those are my glasses. I was out hunting quail or something and I lost them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, but what they did was they, you know, after they hid the body, they sent a, they typed up a ransom note um, to the family saying that they had kidnapped this boy and asking for money. And then they throw the typewriter in a lake. So, of course, you know, they, the police recover the typewriter. <laughs> And uh, they discover some other items that were typed up by Leopold that match the type of this typewriter. They, there's, typewriters have a very distinct footprint, and this one matched that typewriter. So uh, they, <laughs> they um, and it, apparently this body was very poorly hidden. They didn't do such a great job of... Um, hiding the body. So they the family of Leopold hires Clarence Darrow to defend him. And apparently this Clarence Darrow gave such, you know, he never really said these guys are innocent, but he gave a very impassioned speech against the death penalty to the point where the judge just gave them both life in prison. He didn't get the death penalty. Well, the family of these that the family of Leopold who hired Darrow refused to pay him because they were so incensed that you know he didn't get their kids off these kids thought the laws didn't apply to them um so he refused to pay Darrow <laughs> he reneged on the contract which is interesting so uh, while in jail Loeb was killed he was uh, killed with a razor by another inmate um in the prison shower <laughs> Loeb was gay, by the way, so it's probably not a great place to be if you're uh, gay in prison. Um, and Leopold was released on parole in 1958 um, with the help of noted poet Carl Sandberg, who testified on his behalf. Um, and he lived out his uh, the rest of his life in Puerto Rico and died in 1971. So that is this day in history. Very strange crime. Very strange crime. You know, for people that were so smart, they didn't, you know, <laughs> they got caught within days, a couple of days they get caught. And then they ended up confessing, you know, so <laughs> crazy, crazy. All right. I, I can't put it off any longer. I'll have to go to work. <sighs> so tonight is Mickey Sunshine's live, my bestie, at 7 p.m. Central Time. Now, she's had a flare-up, uh, but I, she, I'm sure she'll go live. She, she always tells me, the show must go on, and then she laughs. I love her. Um, she laughs through her pain. Then at, that's at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, 8 Eastern, 
and then at 8 Eastern, or no, at 8 Central Standard Time, 9 Eastern, is DP Addiction Adventures, another one of my besties. Um, so I will be in their lives. Say hello to me, and I will see you tomorrow in the morning show. I love you all. Bye.